All right, so we're starting off with uh, units of measurement. And this again should be review, so I'm gonna go kind of fast through this. If you need to spend more time on this, then let me know, and uh, we'll work through that. So this is actually a sad story. In 1999, which is a long time ago now, NASA lost the $125 million Mars Climate Orbiter, and so it's supposed to be the first weather satellite orbiting a planet other than Earth. And on its way there, they needed to input a course correction. And part of the satellite was built not in the US. And so the navigation module was expecting course corrections in units, uh, metric units. And the NASA scientists input the corrections in English units. And so when it went to make the corrections, uh, it made the wrong corrections with the wrong amount of force and ended up going too far into the atmosphere and crashed into Mars. Um, if you don't know, it takes something like six to nine months to get to Mars at the very closest approach. So units can be super important. I guess the more relevant situation, especially if you want to do something like nursing, is when you're administering a dose of a drug to somebody, the units of that dose are super important because the dose makes the poison, right? So if you give somebody an IV dose of something and you're off on those units and you give them 10 times as much, it might go from being a therapeutic thing to a thing that kills them. So units are very important and we're gonna spend a lot of time harping on units, basically in every calculation. If you don't know what a unit is, it's a standard quantity used to specify measurement or a measurement. Right? And these are critical because if I tell you something is a meter away or that I'm a meter tall, but if you don't know what a meter is, then that doesn't make any sense to you. In the case of the Mars Climate Orbiter, if we're trying to send instructions to that orbiter, we need to speak in terms of a unit that it understands. It needs to essentially agree on what these units are so that we can communicate. So the two most common unit systems are the metric system and the English system. Metric used in almost the entire rest of the world. English system used in the United States. Uh, and scientists use the international system of units, uh, which is based on the metric system. And that comes from a French abbreviation, actually, uh, that I'm not gonna try and butcher. These are the basic SI units, which are also metric units. We have length, which is in units of meter, right? How far away is that? It's some number of meters away. We have mass, which is uh, not quite the same as weight, uh, but that's in kilograms. So how heavy is something? You would say in kilograms, how heavy it is. Units of time, seconds, that one's easy and familiar. The SI unit of temperature is actually Kelvin. So not Celsius, although Celsius and Kelvin have the same, uh, the same size of degree. Uh, if we wanna talk about an amount of substance, talk about the mole which we're not gonna to get to the mole for a week or two, but uh, you should know, have some idea of what a mole is. For electric current, so the flow of electrons in a wire, in a circuit, that's the ampere or amps. Um, you might have blown a breaker in your house or tripped a GFI because you pulled too many amps from it. Actually, just the other night, my wife blew a breaker because she had our uh, foodie air fryer, which draws 1800 watts and she tried to use a mini water heater, which I think draws another 1,000 watts or something, and so it tripped the breaker pretty quick. Um, then luminosity is actually the candela, which is related to, but I can't remember how, uh, the amount of light produced by a candle. Uh, here are some common conversions. Um, I'll pull this back up when we're going over some of these questions, and I have you guys working on those. Um, but just sort of at a glance, you can see like kilometer to mile. So a kilometer, one kilometer is smaller than one mile. Right? It's about 0.6 or 62% of a mile. Uh, for the most part, I will give you, um, if they're required, I'll give you English to metric conversions. I do expect you to learn the SI prefix conversions. We'll go over those. Uh, so scientific notation um, should be another thing that's familiar, but scientific notation is our shorthand for expressing really large numbers or really small numbers instead of writing out all of the zeros. Because uh, 14 billion light years 
is a lot of zeros to right. And so instead, we could rewrite that as 1.4 times 10 to the 3, 6, 9, 10. Light years. All right, so 1.4 times 10 to the 10, a lot easier to write than uh, all nine of those zeros. So the scientific notation has two parts. There's the decimal part. And when we're talking about sig figs later, the decimal part is where the sig figs are. Uh, and we have the exponent part. And really what the exponent part is telling you is how many zeros are there for large numbers? Well, actually for large and small numbers, right? It's how many times you need to move the decimal place. So we would say that these two numbers are the same. So if you want to convert something into scientific notation, you always have to include this exponent part because 1.4 by itself would not be the same as 14 billion. All right, prefix multipliers. So SI metric systems use what's really another shorthand for scientific notation, where we use prefix multipliers to sort of very, very, very quickly indicate what is essentially scientific notation, right? So each of the multipliers will change the value of a unit by powers of 10, just like the exponent in scientific notation. So if we're talking about a kilometer, a kilometer has a prefix of kilo. And kilo means a thousand. So a kilometer is a thousand meters. And so we could write that as one kilometer equals a thousand meters, or 10 to the three meters uh, equals a thousand meters equals one kilometer. If you have the choice, choose a prefix multiplier that's close to the size of the quantity you're measuring. All right, if you do some calculation and you get, I'll use the same number, right? 14,000 or 14 billion light years. Yeah, so 14 billion light years, uh, a more appropriate unit to use would be, it would be 14 giga light years, because one giga light year is one times 10 to the nine light years. So here's a whole table of all of these. And I think that the easiest way to memorize these is that every time it comes up, every time that you see a prefix multiplier, first try and just remember what it is. Keep this handy though, a chart like this. And so try to remember what it is first, make your best guess, write it down even, and then go and look at the chart. And slowly over time, you will get these down. And you don't need to memorize all of them. Um, let's see if I can highlight some of the more common ones. So kilo is a very common one. Centi, milli. Um, those are probably the three most common. And then maybe, um, maybe micro also. And that's kind of the range that most of the numbers we're going to use are going to be within. So if you get those four down really well, that's gonna go a long way. The other ones are kind of on top of that. If you are familiar with technology at all, that always helps me out with the large numbers. So, right, I don't know if any of you guys remember things being in uh, kilobytes. You used to only get computers with kilobytes of RAM. Uh, and then it was megabytes. And I remember being super excited to get a 128 megabyte like SD card essentially. <laughs> and like, I'll never fill this up. <laughs> and then now you can get gigabytes and you can even buy terabyte SD cards. So kilo, mega, giga, tera, all kind of line up with sort of technologies, sizes of memory storage. If that's helpful, it's helpful. If it's not, it's not. Um, Right then, so should have this on there. It should say slide 13. I don't believe I changed any of the slide numbers. So uh, give you a couple minutes. All right, so how long is 4.5 megameters and meters? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so you could do it. So you would do it like this. We would write out the uh, 4.5 megameters, and if you wanted to use this as a conversion, you'd take our 
uh, mega here. So mega meters, one, a mega means one million, or one times 10 to the six. And so we could write this out even as one times 10 to the six meters equals one mega meter. And we'll talk more about uh, converting units a little bit later on. But we'll put the units that we want to cancel out on the bottom of the units that we were given, and then one times 10 to the six meters. And so yeah, 4.5 times 10 to the six meters. And somebody else for the 7.13 times 10 to the negative nine liters? 7.13 liters? Yeah. So we could take our 7.13 times 10 to the negative nine, and then nanoliter, so nano is this, which is one times 10 to the negative nine, so if we have 7.13 times 10 to the negative nine, this is going to be one times 10 to the negative nine liters is one nanoliter. And so that ends up just being 7.13 nanoliters. Like I said, we'll talk in more in depth about conversion factors in a bit, but. Okay, so those are sort of the straight up units. Um, we also have units that are called derived units. So a derived unit is a combination of other units. And so we use them to describe more complicated things. Um, also, that is my mom sitting in a cubic meter. meter. <laughs> uh, so uh, some examples of that that are common, or at least one is miles per hour, right? So how fast are you going? You can only describe that by the distance that you cover in the amount of time that it takes you to cover that distance, right, to get from A to B. You could also, in metric units, be meters per second. Uh, any, or, so a volume is a measure of space, and there are a couple ways that you can kind of look at this. One of them is as a uh, derived unit. So in terms of, I 3D printed these last night. <laughs> We'll see if they actually make for good, good sort of demonstration. So derived units are combinations of other units, and that can be different units, like meters and seconds, or miles and hours, or it could be combinations of the same unit. So here I've got these. These are um, each a uh, cubic centimeter. So they're one centimeter on all four or on all sides. Um, this is uh, two cubic centimeters. So if we want to take this, a single, let's take a zoom this in. Nope, that's the light. Oh, it's up here. All right, so you can take these and we can combine these cubic centimeters to make All right, so it takes two cubic centimeters in all d dimensions. Ah, it's not perfect. You can come and play with these later, though. All right, so it's a derived unit. So if I was to measure this along this side, along this side, it would be one centimeter or two centimeters. This side would be two centimeters, and then the height would also be two centimeters. And so by multiplying those three values together, we're combining multiple, type, multiple of the same unit and getting a derived unit for volume. Because to describe the space, we have to describe the square that it's in and then how, big, how tall that square is. The common formula sort of that you would use for that is length times width times height, right? Volume of a box. So we can describe the volume as something like millimeters cubed, or meters cubed, millimeters cubed, or centimeters cubed. Uh, you could also use feet cubed or miles cubed, that kind of thing. Um, but another common unit that we use for volume is the liter and the milliliter. Now, unlike the cubed 
versions of length, so you can have length cubed, that'll give us volume. The liter and the milliliter are not derived units. So we don't have to describe a space uh, as a derived unit when we used liters and milliliters. <clears throat> oh, see, this is where I'm supposed to use these. Uh, so how many small cubes measuring one centimeter on each side are needed to construct a large cube measuring 10 centimeters? Or, um, yeah, 10 centimeters on a side? Well, it's not just, you know, because it's not just um, filling out one side, but you have to fill out the entire cube. So you need 10, you would need 10 of these little centimeter cubes across one edge, and then that would get you one side of it. But then you need 10 along the other edge, so you make a square, um, or sort of two sides of it, and then you need 10 tall as well. So to fill up that entire volume uh, ends up being more than just 10 times. It ends up being 10 times 10 times 10. <clears throat> All right, another common derived unit is density. Density is a very useful derived unit. Um, so the density of the substance is the ratio of its mass to its volume. And you can treat this as a formula, right? Mass divided by volume but I would encourage you to think of it in terms of its units and think about calculating it that way because the units of density are a unit of mass divided by a unit of volume. Um, so usually grams per milliliter or grams per centimeter cubed. Um, density is a physical property and it does depend on temperature. So usually if you heat things up, they expand. If you cool them down, they contract. Uh, and that affects the density because you're changing the volume. The mass stays the same. A lot of different uh, metals especially have uh, pretty identifiable uh, densities. Right, so platinum is very dense. I believe the most dense metal is osmium, which is a rare metal. Um, I think its density is like 40. It's very high. Gold's pretty dense. We can see that all of these different metals have different densities. So for the same volume of metal, uh, one will be heavier or lighter than the others. Uh, the density of water at four degrees C is one. At room temperature, it's about 1.01. 1 .01. Um, usually just treat it as one. So density is also an intensive property, which means it doesn't depend on the amount of substance. All right, so to use these as an example, these are both printed in PLA, which is polylactic acid, uh, and with a 15% infill. So the density of these should be the same, even though this one is uh, two centimeters cubed and this one's only one centimeter cubed. And I could take this and I could cut it in half and still have the same density, right? It doesn't matter how much there is. If you took a piece of wood and cut off just a small piece of wood, it's gonna have the same density as the entire piece of wood. Um, and that's in contrast to extensive properties, <clears throat> where extensive properties depend on the amount of substance. And that's most of our uh, sort of simple and non-derived units, or yeah, derived units. So mass, length, volume, right? If you have more of a substance, it's gonna have a larger mass, it's probably gonna be longer, at least in some dimension, and its volume is gonna increase as well. Okay, so a man receives a platinum ring from his fiance. Before the wedding, he notices that the ring feels a little light for its size and decides to determine its density. He places the ring on a balance and finds that it has a mass of 3.15 grams. He then finds that the ring displaces 0 0.233 centimeters cubed of water. Is the ring made of platinum? No. All right, so if we calculate its density, we're gonna take 3.15 grams divided by 0 0.233 centimeters cubed. Uh, I think 3.15 divided by 0.233. So just to see it, this is gonna be 13.5 grams per centimeter cubed. So does that mean it's made out of mercury? 
<laughs> oh yeah, that's right. When I was doing this one earlier, I was like, oh yeah, that's the density of Mercury. There's gotta be something else. <laughs> She's trying to kill him otherwise. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mercury, very toxic. <laughs> There's a lot of it right here. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> not made of Mercury. Uh, we should look that up later though. Yeah, well I meant see if there's something else with the density of 13.5 oh, okay. to be able to say it's like, okay, it's not Mercury. Okay. okay, so the woman in this example is shocked, of course, because she bought a ring made of Mercury, supposedly. Um, she returns it, <laughs> uh, and she should probably sue wherever she bought it from uh, because they tried to kill her and her husband. But she buys a new ring, and this ring has a mass of 4.53 grams and a volume of 0.212. Centimeters cubed, is this made of platinum? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so another 4.53 grams, 0 0.212 centimeters cubed, and it's 21.4. So she didn't get ripped off twice. <laughs> Uh, I guess the other thing is it could have been hollowed out and filled in with something else cheaper, right? Most jewelry is just plated in something else. I was gonna say, if it was made of mercury, I'd be more interested in how they got it to be solid. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. the guy's very, very cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so this one's a little trickier. Uh, so the density of copper decreases as temperature increases, uh, as does the density of most substances. Huh? We don't have that. Oh, you don't have this one? No. Oh, well. We still do it. We still do it. It's up here. I think that's why I put. I didn't put it in there because it wasn't anything to calculate. Um, okay. So which change occurs in a sample of copper when it's warmed from room temperature to 95 degrees C? How is it becoming less dense? Okay, so he thinks, does anybody think uh, A, the sample's becoming lighter? No. Who thinks B, the sample becomes heavier? Now that would have the opposite effect and also be impossible. Uh, so C, the sample expands? Yeah, yeah all right. Yeah, so the sample's expanding, right? So if the volume increases, uh, right? So we got mass over volume. If V gets larger, then it makes it a smaller number. All right, scientific measurements. <clears throat> oh, right, right, right. So when you're measuring things, um, making scientific measurements, we report, we make those measurements such that every digit is certain except for the last one, right? The last one always contains your best guess. Um, so like here, there's the carbon monoxide concentrations in Los Angeles County. One is made here with a tens place, right? And then this other one is made without that. So uh, depending on how the data is collected and then calculated, uh, you might need one or the other. Uh, and that number of digits recorded is gonna depend on the measuring device. So scientists always read between the lines. It's kind of in more ways than one. So you always wanna estimate one decimal place past the smallest division. Now for measuring from digital scales, right? So all of the masses that we take are gonna be on digital scales. Uh, you always just record all of the numbers. That last number already includes uncertainty, right? Because if it's, let's say you put something on the scale and your scale only reads like most kitchen scales to one gram. If it's actually 10.5 grams, the scale can only display two digits. It will round up and it will report 11 grams. So you could actually be off by as much as half a gram because your scale's doing that rounding. Um, so for digital scales, always record everything. <clears throat> so like on this scale here, these are divisions of one gram. And so it's just past the one gram mark. So we might call it 1.2, 1.1. That's where you're gonna make your best guess, right? Try to visualize 
uh, usually starting at the halfway point and say, okay, is it less than half, and then how much less than half? Also, if I'm going too slow and I, you want me to go faster, we can go faster. <laughs> We've got a lot of slides. Um, okay, you guys don't have these ones either. Take a minute. Uh, this is, oops, this is 110 there. So how would you read this uh, in degrees Celsius? Get a few, a few people to answer. What was it? Like 103.1. Sure, 103.1. 103, at 103, you have to say 0. 0.0. 0.0, yeah. So we get more accurate than to the physical past at some point. It's not accurate enough. Right, yeah. So we can't estimate any further because, um, yeah, because it goes up to the 3, so we estimate or it goes up to the ones place, so I submit one pass that to the tenths. There's a lot of room, room for interpretation on that last decimal place. And you don't need to, because there's so much room for interpretation, you don't need to really, really agonize over trying to create the little divisions in your mind and really try to zone in on what it is. Just give it a best guess, right? So on this one, and this is four, that's a, just a four, there's no 40. So four, what would you say it is? 0.5, yeah, 4.56, could even say 4.59 even. I mean, it's really close to that 4.6. I probably wouldn't say it's 4.60 because it's not on the line. And then just, just to make sure that I say this, um, when you're reading from a graduated cylinder, you always want to read from the bottom of this. I describe it as a contact lens, right? So you want to read from the bottom of that meniscus because the amount of water that's actually contained in this area, I believe is calibrated for in the graduated cylinder. Also, it's a very small amount of water. Cool. All right, sig figs. This is one of the, uh, Banes of, I guess, just chemistry in general. Um, a lot of pain points over sig figs. So the precision of the measurement depends on the instrument used to make the measurement. That's all good, right? If it's a digital scale, read off everything that it says. Um, if it's like a ruler, right, read one past the smallest division. Okay, well now you take those numbers and you do calculations with them. So how do you maintain a correct level of precision throughout all of your calculations. And that's what sig figs is, right? So your end result can only be as accurate as your least accurate instrument. So, or it's another way to say it would be like your calculation is only as strong as the weakest link. Um, so significant figures are the non-placeholding digits in a record, in a recorded measurement. They include all the certain digits and the estimated digit. So the greater number of sig figs, significant figures, the greater certainty of the measurement. All right, these are the quick summarized uh, rules. I did post the lecture slides. I should have pointed that out on Canvas. In the home module at the bottom, I put lecture materials, I think is what I called it and that's where I'll post all of the lecture slides. So you go in there, this table's on there, um, and we'll go over these pretty quick. Fortunately, we have lab for this, so we can just roll into the lab. <laughs> uh, all right, so all non-zero digits are significant. I think that's the easiest rule. Non-zero digits are significant, and this is assuming that you're reading a number that's been reported. Right? This is not you making your own measurement. This is a reported number. Um, so for example, this 13.301, uh, all of those non-zero digits are significant. Interior zeros, so if there's a non-zero digit on either side of a zero, the zero is significant. Uh, leading zeros are not significant, they are never significant. So if a if the first number on the left, you count all of the, you count 
well, I should say discount. You, know, you don't count any of the zeros if the number starts with zeros. They only serve to locate the decimal point. Trailing zeros are slightly different. Um, trailing zeros are uh, significant if there is a decimal point written in the number. So for example, right, it's a little bit bigger. These numbers and these numbers all have a decimal point written in. And so that could be like here where it's 3.9 decimal and then a zero, that zero is significant. Um, trailing zeros before an implied decimal point, so no decimal point written in, are ambiguous and should be avoided. So whenever you report a number, this is the perfect time to use scientific notation, right? Really big numbers with trailing zeros, use scientific notation because they're just ambiguous. Alex, if you're writing numbers and it says, hey, give me this answer with significant figures, uh, let's say your answer is 37, it's, I don't know if it's gonna require you to put a decimal point there, but it likes to have a decimal even if there are no trailing zeros. It's not really necessary because we know if you wrote the number that it's significant, but that's one of the quirks of Alex. It is really pretty good overall. Exact numbers. So exact numbers have no uncertainty and therefore do not limit the significant figures in any calculation. Uh, really, you can think of them as having an unlimited number of significant figures because it is exactly that number. Um, some examples, if you're counting discrete objects, it's so like two pencils or two people or um, two, I don't know, cats, right? That's, there are exactly two cats. You can't, well, you shouldn't hopefully have a cat and a half. It's not how we count cats. Uh, uh, anyways, moving on. Integral numbers that are part of an equation. So um, the diameter equals two times the radius. That two is an exact number. Uh, defined quantities is the sort of murkiest one. When is it a defined quantity? When is it not? Um, if you're converting, let's see, where is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So conversions within the same system are exact, while conversions between the English and the metric system are not. Uh, the one exception that I can think of off the top of my head, and it might be the only, eh, it's almost definitely not the only, but uh, if you have one inch, that is exactly equal to 2.54 centimeters. At some point, I believe the inch was based on the width of the king's thumb. Now we define it by centimeters. <laughs> okay. So I believe I did put this one on there. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, yeah, so go, th go through these. Write down your answers for how many significant figures there are.
All right. So we got 554 kilometers. How many sig figs is that? Three. Seven pennies. Infinity. Or it's an exact number, right? Because you're counting a number of pennies. We can say that they're exactly seven pennies. There's no doubt that there are three pe or seven pennies. If you're in a situation where for some reason you have a penny that's cut in half, that's a whole different thing. I guess then it would be exactly seven and a half pennies. Sorry, that's getting murky. Infinite, or you could say exact number. We'd say, you would say infinite because it's not going to affect any of your calculations. Uh, how about 101 times 10 to the five? How many sig figs is that? Three. So the decimal portion is what determines the number of sig figs. The times 10 to the five is just a placeholder. 0 0.00099, just two. Leading zeros, not significant, ever. Uh, there are very few things that I could say with confidence, uh, but leading zeros never being significant is one of them. Uh, 1.4500 0, 0 kilometers. Five sig figs. We've got a decimal place written in, so trailing zeros are significant. How about 21,000 meters? Ambiguous, yeah, safe bet would be two. But I would say ambiguous. If a decimal point was written in there, then it would be five. All right, yeah. Any questions about sig fig so far? No, okay. All right, so when we're doing calculations, this is where we're starting to combine these sig figs um, and then come up with a, an answer that represents the precision of our weakest link, really. So uh, you shouldn't gain or lose precision, right? You don't want to give up any precision, any confidence in your answer, uh, but you also shouldn't sort of incorrectly gain precision when you're doing mathematical operations. So rules for multiplication to division, I think this one's the easiest. You look at all of the numbers that you're multiplying or dividing, and you pick out which one of them has the smallest number of sig figs, and that's the number of sig figs that your answer gets. The vast majority of calculations in chemistry end up being just this, because we primarily do unit conversions. Um, so you can usually take the first one and say, oh, the end answer will have the same number of sig figs. So that's if you're multiplying things. Here we have two sig figs, and so the answer has two sig figs. If you're dividing, we have five and three sig figs. So the answer should only end up with three. <clears throat> and when you're counting those sig figs, uh, if you want sort of a more procedural way of doing it, you basically start on the left, and then you go until you hit a non-zero number. That's your first sig fig. And then from there, you count, and you say, so for this first example, right, we got this number. So first non-zero number is six, and we only get two sig figs. So we would say, that's our first, that's our second, and so that's where we would round. All right, on this one, we start with a zero, technically. So we skip that, right? Not a non-zero number. Start at six, and then we say we get three sig figs. So we get one, two, and then three. That's where we round for our final answer. The rules for addition and subtraction by themselves are also not too bad. For addition and subtraction, it's always the same number of decimal places. Um, so it helps to stack numbers on top of each other or to just count the number of decimal places um, in your addition or subtraction operation. And you round off after the last, well, after the decimal place of the number with the smallest number of decimal places. I think that by themselves, rules for addition and subtraction, rules for multiplication and division, not too bad. Uh, it's the combination of the two that gets a little bit, a little bit more complicated. All right, so rules for rounding. So when rounding to the correct number of sig figs, round down if the first digit dropped is four or less, round up if it's five or more. 
and you only look at that last significant digit. <clears throat> so for example, uh, if we were rounding this number, 24,938.99 cents, and we wanted just three sig figs, that would be one, two, three. And so our rounded answer would be 24,900, well, I'll order the decimal place in. Ah, but that's not great, we have trailing zeros. So wanna move that into scientific notation, and you can do that either before you round or after you round. So this would be 2.49 times 10 to the four. And just to give, yeah, to give an example, this kind of thing can happen. So if you have like 0 0.199 and you need to round to two sig figs, right, what happens? Yeah, so we're gonna keep these two numbers, but that means that the nine is gonna round up to 10, so this is gonna be 0 0.20. That would be our correct two sig figs, and sometimes that can happen with a whole chain of them, a whole chain of nines. So if it rounds up, then you just carry it over. Don't forget to carry the one. All right, so these are all examples of rounding up or rounding down at two sig figs. And then even if you get something like this, right, you ignore everything after that digit. So even though this is 5.349, um, you ignore the nine, and since it's a four, we still round it down. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, I just talked way too much about the syllabus and stuff. Um, okay. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. So, rounding and multi step calculations. My advice is to do your best to always keep all of your numbers in the calculator if possible. Um, one of the things that I really like about the TA36X Pro is you can store numbers as variables and then either pull those up or reuse those in calculations later. Um, it also, like most TI calculators, has an answer button, which will just insert your answer from your previous calculation. And you can avoid having to write out a bunch of stuff um, and keep all of the digits in your calculator. But if you don't know how to do that, if it's too complicated, if you're not comfortable with it, keep at least two extra digits. So whatever number of sig figs you have, keep two extra for each calculation, and that'll help avoid rounding errors. That'll get more significant when we get to acids and bases. Rounding in pH, when you're calculating pHs from concentrations is lots of rounding error. All right, so you should never round until your final answer, final reported answer. Sorry, I'm really struggling because we're already over. And uh, how's everybody feeling so far? Is this a lot? Feeling overwhelmed? Feeling okay? Feeling good? All right. We'll get through, uh, let's go through these ones and then we'll take a short break. But then I do not want to get off uh, track on the first day. So um, we will finish this out. There's a lot of examples at the end. So. Uh, yeah, so for each of these calculations and, uh, right, perform each calculation, the correct number of sig figs. Uh, the thing that I haven't talked about yet actually is C, so we'll do C here. Here we have an example of combining multiplication and division and addition or subtraction. And when that's the case, you kind of need to use a method of keeping, a tra keeping track of your sig figs and intermediate calculations. So you're gonna follow the order of operations, as always. And so our first calculation then is gonna be the 44.11 plus 1.223. 
So that's going to be 45.333. Now, we're not done with this calculation yet. So we want to keep all of those numbers, but how many sig figs does this technically have now? Four. All right, so doing addition here, so we use the rules for addition and subtraction, smallest number sig figs. So the way I like to do it is I underline what my last significant digit is. So if I was to report just this number, it would be 4.5, sorry, 45.33. Now we can take that whole number, plug it into our calculation. Um, so we're gonna do the 2.5 110 times 21.20 divided by 45.333. And so then the result of that is going to be 1.17427. Right, so now this was my last significant digit here, this three. So that means that this has a total of four sig figs, this one has how many sig figs? Four, and our last number has how many? Five. Yeah, five. So smallest number of sig figs is four. So our final answer here will be one, two, three, four sig figs at 1.174. And that would be the reported answer. So just make sure that you're keeping track of those. All right, so for the first one, what is the answer? Zero point three eight one, right? Because our smallest number of sig figs, three hundred one. And then I guess I just mentioned this, like the zero in front of the decimal place is not like explicitly required, but. Putting it there makes it easier to see. Oh, of course, it stopped working. <laughs> Putting it there uh, makes it easier to tell that there's supposed to be that there is a decimal place there. Always the technical difficulties. There we go. Zero point three eight one. All right, for the second one. 121. And then because this is written, uh, wait, just 121? No, 10. Oh, 10. Nice. This is a situation where the nine rounds up. Um, yeah. And then for D. Yeah. Eight is uh, the answer. It's just, well, eight. Yeah. Alex would want a decimal. Um, when I say, well, I think everybody knows what I mean when I say Alex. I'm not talking about a person named Alex who's very particular. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Alex is the uh, online homework software that we're using. A L E K S. Um, sorry. Uh, this one is funny because when you multiply 12.01 by 0 0.3, 0 0.3 only has a single significant figure. Um, so 12.01 times 0.3 is 3.603. Uh, so your only significant figure there is three. But we don't want to round yet. And so when we add that to 4.811, bless you, um, you get 4.811. And then that's going to be 8.414. But because this is one sig fig, our final answer is just going to be 8. So this is a perfect example of why you need precision in all of your measurements. Because if you have one bad measurement, that means that everything else is less precise um, in your resulting calculation, at least. Um, all right, I did remember that there is a day built in for catching up, so we will just move on to the stuff we're supposed to do in lab uh, and pick this up on.